Anesthesia for the VIP, or very important patient. Do you know who I am? Treating a VIP patient, is that an honor or a poison chalice? Every doctor has, at some point in time, been called upon to care for a VIP patient. It may happen more often to anesthesiologists, given the terror of the general public at the prospect of going under. So what do you, the anesthesiologist, do in this case? Now, of course, we are all human and it is flattering to be requested by a VIP. There may also be the added prestige or even generous tokens of gratitude at stake. So today, I look at the dangers of allowing your ego to overrule your head, how to emerge with your integrity intact and what really is the best treatment that you can offer to a VIP. And even though us doctors should know better, it can be tempting to opt for a bespoke treatment involving a different anesthetic for a VIP, something different than you do on a daily basis. I have on a few occasions even heard my colleagues, doctors, drop the names of the celebrity patients they took care of. Name dropping is a serious breach of patient confidentiality. So there is a reminder that who you treated should never take the precedence over how you treated him. But think Michael Jackson. With all of his fame and financial resources, he did not receive the best care the United States medical system has to offer. His celebrity status actually contributed to him receiving a lower standard of care leading to a much less desirable outcome than he would have received as just a regular guy on the street. Is it acceptable for a VIP to request a special treatment? There are many institutions and countries where it is not only accepted, but actually expected. Germany is one where VIP patients are routinely treated by the chiefs of service or reputable professors. While this may offer the VIP patients some assurance that they are getting the best care possible, in reality, are they? Well, let's dive deeper. Who is best equipped to conduct your anesthesia? The head of the department may be a much decorated eminence grease, riding away in his ivory terrain and venturing out only occasionally to lecture to his or her students, and two or three times a year just to keep he or her hands in, he or she dusts off his scraps and trundles out to the operating theater hoping he can remember the drill from the last time. And my goodness, aren't the surgeons looking younger these days? Is this really who you would trust to take your life in their hands? Or would you prefer the gifted young clinician bang up to date with the latest techniques and guidelines who regularly takes his patients safely through procedures day in, day out? I know who I would choose. And if you'd like to know what I actually chose when I was offered the opportunity to choose my anesthesiology team, when I had my surgery, I recorded a video about my experience, what happens when an anesthesiologist becomes a patient. And you can go and watch it here. So what do I do differently when I'm asked to administer anesthesia to a VIP patient? And the answer is nothing. As always, regardless of the patient, I deliver the best service I have available. And my best service is not some sort of a top drawer that I offer only for special occasions. The best service is a service that we as a team have tried and tested and perfected until we know the drill as a second nature. This is also the safest service and our standard service. In fact, any deviation from that standard service that you do every day would introduce a weak link to the procedure until fully tested. This is a serious downside to the special treatment and there are others. For example, when treating a VIP, the doctors may try to spare their special patients from pain or time-consuming care by opting to skip basic tests or procedures, even when those analyses yield vital information. Others may choose to go in the opposite side and soup up the VIP treatment with extra unnecessary tests, either because the doctor, aware of the high profile of the patient and an added scrutiny, tags on additional measures just to be sure, or even worse, just to be seen of doing something special. And there is more. 
The prima donna factor, where the anesthesiologist pulls out all the stuffs to attempt an impromptu performance of an anesthesia technique that they haven't yet mastered. Would you want to put your life in the hands of someone more concerned about showing off their rusty repertoire than prioritizing your safety? As an example is where patients having orthopedic surgery benefit from regional anesthesia and nerve blocks. However, these regional anesthesia techniques are effective and safe only in the hands of practitioners who are highly trained to deliver them. As such, an occasional regionalist is much more likely to deliver subpar results for the patients. Can't you see the dangers mounting up? The extra attention afforded the special patient or the VIP and the pressure felt by the practitioner can really soon turn into a VIP syndrome, a series of bad judgments, unnecessary tests, second guessing and ultimately substandard care. So how can it be avoided? Well, the VIP patients should be treated exactly the same as any other patient with a similar presentation and care should be taken to follow the standard clinical procedure as closely as possible. When somebody asks me what would I do special for a VIP patient, my answer is nothing different than what I do every day. Do you agree? Is deviation from the standard practice beneficial or harmless in some cases? Is the substandard practice ever acceptable? And what is your experience of VIP patients expecting special treatment? Have you ever come across prima donna practitioners yourself? I invite you to leave your comments and your experiences with your VIP patients. And if you like our channel, make sure you subscribe and never miss the future videos. See you at the bedside.